thank you for joining me today. I appreciate that. Um, tell me, you're a veteran of the Army, correct? Right. Okay. So give me a little idea of when you served. I went into the into the uh, the Army in uh, May 28th, uh, 1968. Okay. And then I got out of the service in June of 1972. Okay. So um, did you join or were 74. you? 74. Okay, 74. Did you join or were you uh, drafted? Uh, I had actually, uh, I was going to a Midwestern University in Wichita Falls, and I had flunked out. And uh, I knew that I was going to be, uh, I was going to be drafted. I'd gotten my, my notice and everything. So I went down uh, to the recruiter. I had a couple of years of college, uh, a successful college. <laughs> it wasn't all that bad. But anyway, uh, I asked what he could do for me, what, uh, you know, what we could, uh, I always wanted to be a pilot. I, I, I could, I'd never cared about going to college. I just wanted to fly. And uh, he said, well, he said, uh, we have a warrant officer uh, aviation flight program, helicopters, would you be interested in that? And I said, well, yeah. So they, he had to take a uh, battery of tests and, um, I did, and I, I, I talked, before that, I talked to a, a captain I was friends with, picked guitar with, he's a banjo player, and I picked guitar with him. And he f had flown helicopters, so he is the very, very fundamentals, you know, what the controls do, for example. Well, that gave me enough information then to do pretty well on those tests. And then, uh, so I signed a contract with the military, and um, that upon uh, graduation from basic training, I'd be sent to uh, uh, flight school. And uh, uh, they were truly the word. I did graduate from uh, basic training, and uh, I was immediately sent to uh, flight school at Fort Walters, which is down by Mineral Wells, Texas. So I went through flight school uh, there. Then that was the first phase. Second phase at Fort Rucker, Alabama. And I went th uh, through that successfully. And uh, I got my wings in about uh, April, April of uh, 68. So how old were you when you joined? I was probably about 22. Okay. So by the time I was 23, why? I was rocking and rolling in Vietnam, so, yeah. you know, I, and I was like, considered somewhat older than uh, a lot of the guys there. <laughs> you know, you had 18-year-old high school guys, some 17, I guess. So we were uh, just a bunch of young guys. When they told you you were, you were on your way to Vietnam, uh, I mean, what did you know about what was happening there? Well, they told me I was going to go to Vietnam before, before we even started uh, flight school. They say one or two, possibly three of you will not go to Vietnam, but the rest of you are going to Vietnam. So get your heads right about that. If you don't, if that's not acceptable, then you know let's need to try something else. And uh, they were true to the word. Uh, I got, uh, before I graduated from uh, flight school, they gave me my orders. And uh, so, uh, and their orders were to Vietnam, but to a reporting station. Uh, beyond that, I, you know, I had no idea where I was going. But uh, before, right before I went over there, I remember uh, they had this uh, battle going on, Hamburger Hill. I don't know if you uh, heard, heard of that or anything. I've heard of it, but we'll yeah. talk about it a little bit. Well, they, uh, we had, uh, the, the, the army had kind of stumbled on this thing by, uh, by accident. It was just a beehive full of uh, North, North Vietnamese uh, soldiers. 
And uh, we lost uh, we lost some aircraft uh, going in. I, I don't know the de details of that. I've heard of details, but I'm not sure of their veracity. So I won't, I won't say anything. But uh, we we lost some uh, aircraft uh, for sure. And um, uh, and I knew that uh, you know we'd had um, some soldiers uh, killed there, and we, that we landed there successfully and a lot of them were getting uh, killed at least from what I what I understand so that was in the news that was in the so news and of course there was protests in the news mm -hmm. and uh, uh, I tried not to focus too much on uh, protests I did I just tried to focus on what I had to do you know and, and the other stuff just uh, I, I really didn't major, major on. And uh, when I got after I got to Vietnam for a while, uh, I, I started thinking more about that. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, well, I felt like, uh, and I still still carry this around. My wife, she, ought, you don't trust anybody. Well, you're right. I don't trust anybody. And uh, I did, what did Vietnam? Did well, when I. Well, I think so because uh, you know I was that kind of happy-go-lucky guy when I went into the the military. Um, but when, once there, uh, they'd have the uh, the, the uh, what the Army Times there on the bar the at the at the uh, O Club, and I'd be. Uh, reading through there, and I see where they're all the protests were going on. I'd flown uh, quite a few missions at that time, mm -hmm. and uh, I, I started reading those things, and I uh, I felt very much like uh, somebody pushed you out on a limb, and then you hear a noise, and you turn around and look behind you, and somebody sawing it off, and uh, you did not become very trustful of anybody. In Vietnam, you couldn't trust, uh, you know, if you had to be around a lot of civilians, you, you didn't trust anybody. You don't know who's carrying a gun. You have no idea. Or uh, uh, you go to a barber shop and he's giving you a shave with a razor, you know. It didn't, that never happened. It didn't happen to anybody ever knew, but, uh, or knew of, but the thought's still there, you know what I mean? Right. So you're, you, you don't become very trustful of people. Mm -hmm. And, and I'm, I'm that way today, and you talk to my wife, she'll verify that. <laughs> so tell me, um, you arrived in Vietnam, um, what, was, what was your arrival like? I remember uh, went descending into, uh, landed at uh, Benoit Air Base, and descending uh, through the clouds and everything. And once we had, were say 10,000 feet above uh, Vietnam, I could smell the place. It stunk. And uh, we landed and it still stunk. How? Burning feces. Mm. Uh, they didn't have uh, uh, sanitary facilities like uh, you know you, you and I are quite familiar with. Right. You just you went to an outhouse and then they'd take the feces and they would uh, in like uh, old big pans about that big around about that deep and take it and they'd uh, pour some uh, jet fuel or kerosene over it. It's one of the same thing and they set it on fire. <coughs> But of course, that that stunk, as you might you might imagine. Yeah. So, the whole country smelled like that to me. Yeah. After a while, you get used to it. You get used to anything. A human being is an adaptable creature. Really are. How did you adapt? Uh, when I uh, when I finally got to to the company. Uh, 
I was assigned to, which was the uh, uh, 101st Aviation Battalion uh, Company, Bravo. When I got there, the main company was down south around Da Nang. And uh, there was nobody there except a couple of new guys like me. And where were you instead of Da Nang? I was up close to uh, uh, the city of Way in the north and northern I Corps. Okay. And uh, uh, I, I didn't fly any missions because I. Uh, you know, I didn't know anything about country. I didn't know the procedures or anything like that. So you have to get with an experienced pilot, and you're a co-pilot when you when you first get there, and you remain a co-pilot until the the aircraft commanders decide that you're ready to be an aircraft commander. So <clears throat> I didn't think too much about it. I'd gone up a couple times as a passenger. Uh, my first flight, we got shot at. <laughs> Welcome to Vietnam. Which, yeah, that's right. Welcome to Vietnam. But uh, and my last shot f flight, I got shot at. But not so much in between, as you might think. Really? Yeah, I was I was very fortunate. And uh, the uh, then the company came back from uh, south uh, from uh, the Nang area. And uh, they were pretty rough. <laughs> In fact, they were so rough, you know. I went to the commander, base commander. I said, well, I want, I want the hell out of here. I need to transfer. These guys are crazy. What do you mean? Uh, oh, uh, they, they were back, you know, to home plate, so to speak from being down on flying missions uh, around Chu Lai. And, uh, you know, they were glad to be back there celebrating. <laughs> so, uh, and then nobody talked to you. You know, you're the new guy when nobody talked to you. Yeah. And uh, uh, I finally uh, would, would fly uh, uh, assignments as a co-pilot and uh, well, my first one was a doozy, as I remember it. Uh, it was uh, close to the uh, Ashall Valley, which is the main supply route from uh, North uh, Vietnam around Cambodia and into the South of Vietnam. And uh, they were uh, expecting a, a pretty uh, some pretty stiff uh, opposition. Well, I'd never flown one of these things before. Hell, I didn't know what was going on. I mean, they'd tell you, they would train you. We were trained very well, but nobody, you know. Okay, so tell me about this, this first mission. You said it was a doozy. Yeah, well, there was, I think there were uh, close to 100 aircraft involved. Wow. And uh, uh, I was in the second aircraft. We had the lead of the whole, uh, the whole assault in front of me, and I was a second aircraft. You know, I've never been on one of these things for sure. I mean, for real. We trained, <laughs> training is different than real. <laughs> so anyway, we uh, we took took off, and uh, they would have the uh, the troops we were going to carry. They'd have them in lines, about oh uh, six, seven to a line. So when we would land. Uh, we'd be right adjacent to the to the crew you're supposed to pick up. And, you know, I picked up the second seven, so to speak. Or we did. Anyway, we took off, and uh, I didn't have any idea where we were going. I mean, I was showing on the map, but, I, you know, I didn't want to know exactly where we were going. <laughs> I would, too. <laughs> so we we kept flying, and everybody was behind us. You had... Uh, uh, you had your instruments, uh, your instruments there, the, uh, what the, the pilot wanted you to uh, monitor. You had, uh, you had an FM radio, a UHF radio, and a VH, uh, 
VHF radio. You were listening to three radios at, at one time. And then you had the, the crew, the door gunner and the crew chief. You know, they'd be talking, you know, and everybody carrying on a conversation inside the, inside the, the aircraft. And then uh, you had the, those, uh, uh, the regular radios going on. And I, uh, I noticed that to, to our south and to our, uh, and to our west, I, I started this, there was some black, some black smoke. And I didn't, I didn't know where that was coming from, what the purpose was or anything. And we got kind of a, a, a akin to that, and we, and the lead aircraft, he, he started making a slow right-hand turn. And I was sitting there watching that, and I thought, Hell, hell's bells, I think we might be, be headed there. And uh, pretty soon there was, that was exactly where we were headed, you know. <laughs> there was no, and uh, <coughs> uh, uh, we got closer and closer, and I could see uh, gunships. They called them aerial, aerial rocket artillery. They would be going in, you know, and, and shooting. Uh, but before that, they had F move, uh, fast movers come in. I could see them dropping napalm on it. Then, then those guys broke off. The jets did, and uh, our helicopter gunships, uh, air rocket uh, artillery, were were shooting uh, rockets at it. So, I mean, after the after the the uh, the artillery bombardment, the fast movers come in and drop in uh, napalm or whatever and then air rocket artillery uh, going on <clears throat> well we were we we're getting pretty close so the, the pilot said okay Bill this is what you want to do he said keep talking to me on the intercom let me know <coughs> <coughs> let me know our power settings and uh, you know how how much how much torque uh, we're we're pulling and uh, and uh, don't stop doing that. It says you'll hear a lot of noise, but don't stop doing that. Just call that stuff out to me. <coughs> so uh, that's kind of what I did, and we got getting we got really started getting really close, and then the our escort uh, gun jets would come in. They were firing rockets, you know. They, and uh, so you had a lot of exterior noise <laughs> when they'd fire those rockets, you know. It was really loud, much louder than that. And then <clears throat> uh, they would, uh, you know, be shooting many guns and <laughs> made that real loud, guttural type of uh, sound, you know. And then the, the uh, aircraft commander said, okay, you guys, so the the uh, the crew chief and the gunner started shooting away with their uh, M60s, and you had everybody talking on the radio at one time, and I was sitting there, gee, many Christmas, you know, and uh, uh, we we, uh, we landed in a very very small LZ. I remember the LZ was uh, big enough for two uh, two aircraft, as I remember it. So uh, you, you just barely get to touch the ground, and the passenger, the the guys, the the grunts that were on your aircraft, man, they were out of there in a heartbeat. Even before they, you really touched the ground, they were they were getting off because you know you got like what. Uh, thousands, 800 to 1,000 pounds of a JP-4 on board. The airplane is, is built largely out of magnesium, which when you set it fire, it, it burns forever. You can't, you can't put it out with water. So uh, you had that going on, and uh, almost as soon as we touched ground, uh, 
the guy behind me, he be chalk two. That was us. Chalk two's ready, or chalk two's up. Lead aircraft, chalk leads up, and off we'd go. And they'd bring in another pair, you know, just right directly behind us. And that was it. But it scared the it scared the hell out of me, mm -hmm. you know that first uh, that first assault, and then that was my job, and we'd do something like that uh, almost every day it seemed like, and pretty soon I got I got to where I kind of relished the rush. You know, you got a gen. Uh, uh, Oh, what do they call that kind of adrenaline, adrenaline high, you know, uh, pushed out of that. So <clears throat> uh, the louder it was and and uh, the bigger it was, well, just the better I liked it. Mm -hmm. And uh, so uh, that that was my that was my life there for six months. That's what I did, and when we weren't. Uh, Dropping troops off in, in a combat situation where we're picking them up, and uh, if we weren't dropping them off or picking them up, they were re resupplying them, and uh, uh, that, that's what I did. <coughs> Pardon me. <coughs> oh, I have a problem. Um, so I can't imagine. Um, I can't imagine any of that, much less. That's the that's funny part yeah. of it. You know, like I'm talking to you, and I've talked to other adults about, uh, you know, Vietnam and, and, uh, and, you know, how you feel in a combat situation, and people are shooting at you and whatnot. And uh, they, they do their very best to understand what you're saying, you know. And, but most of that, it's just kind of like a, a kind of a blank look on their face. Because they don't have the emotional right. connection, you know. When I'm te when I'm telling you something like that, it it's all fraught with emotion, and but the, the listener, it, they, they don't get a lot of that, mm -hmm. and uh, that that's the way it's always been. That's one of the frustrating parts, I guess, about uh, returning back to the states and then being kind of shun not kind of being shunned. And uh, you try to talk to people, and they have no, no time for you. And then you, you know, you might have one or two friends that did have time for you, but they really couldn't tag with you. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. <coughs> Pardon me. <coughs> Excuse me. Let's try that again. <coughs> yes, I will. But I knew another <coughs> cough was coming. Um, since I can't imagine, I describe, I can't imagine that first feeling of being shot at, much less trying to, no, that it's not like, it's thing. not like uh, some guy running around the hood here trying to sh shoot, shooting yeah. at you or something like, this is the guy who wants to kill you. Yeah, it's not like we see on TV. That's right. This guy wants to kill you and he's, um, because he knows you're, uh, you're after him, and uh, so uh, he's not just shooting around. He he, he intent upon killing you. So that, that you know that's one that's one of the things you you know become aware of. How many of those missions did you fly? Oh goodness. Well, I logged uh, close to 900 hours wow. in uh, Vietnam, and you know the the times I was flying uh, uh, Hueys. Why uh, you got that quite a bit, and uh, well, I don't know exactly how many hours it was. I f also flew uh, what I. What I did not like. I flew missions uh, up out of Quain Tree. That's just right up against the the DMZ, not very far at all. And uh, the Marines had had just 
uh, let go of this mission. Uh, the Marines were, were, were there uh, uh, inserting long-range reconnaissance patrols. And they had just uh, gave, given that mission over to uh, the Green Berets. So uh, we had we would fly up there uh, on occasion in support of the Green Berets. Mm -hmm. And that, when things got kind of spooky, you know. How do you mean? Well, you'd be going in and doing some, going into uh, not just uh, South Vietnam, you, but you're going to be going over into uh, North Vietnam. Or sometimes I went way over into uh, Laos. Of course, all that was classified at the time, but I'm yeah. sure it's not classified anymore. Yeah. Uh, so those are kind of spooky. Yeah. And uh, uh, what did they have you looking for in that case? Well, they would give you a, 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 a in operations there at, in. Uh, Quang Tri, they'd give you uh, a briefing flight, uh, what, and the Green Berets would about what the mission was, what they were going to try to accomplish on the ground, which all, it sounds to me like uh, John Wayne stuff. Wow. You know, I'm sitting there thinking, you know, I don't know if they're going to be able to accomplish this or not. And, uh, you know, I don't know if they did or not. We, we put them in, and uh, we we picked them up. Sometimes they were being shot at as we pe were picking them up. And uh, uh, that's just uh, that's just the way it was. Mm -hmm. I, I didn't particularly like uh, that 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 kind of mission. I thought it was a little a little too much. Mm -hmm. I can imagine. But I guess they had to do it. You know, they're they're all the time seeking intelligence. Yeah. Those helicopters, the Hueys, um, uh, there are people that say that's the sound, you know, that's a great sound. Um, I mean, oh, yeah. That's the symbol, it seems yeah. like, of, yeah. of the. What you, that's what you hear, you know. Mm -hmm. That old what? slap, slap. Yeah. Whop, 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 whop. Mm -hmm. What, I mean, <laughs> why? Did, why was that such an important. Well, what, it really was the helicopter war. And mm -hmm. uh, the whole. The whole effort was really on on uh, through helicopters. You know, you inserted the troops, you extracted them, you resupplied them. If they were getting shot at, with they'd send out the gunships uh, to try to uh, neutralize targets. And uh, you know, I flew I flew gunships for six months, and that was a you know kind of a different deal. And uh, when I was when I was flying and uh, flying Hueys and not flying the aircraft itself, but I was uh, at at the base there, and somebody I had a target outside the wire. Why they'd call in the gunships, and especially at night, uh, when that thing started making gun runs, you know, uh, it was serious. Somebody's going to get it, and. Uh, I guess that's one of the things that made me want to fly gunships. That and the fact that uh, I didn't like getting shot at. I didn't. I don't think anybody does. But but I had an opportunity to uh, transition into gunships, and I, I flew Cobras for the rest of the time I was in the in the military. Well, the supply ships always got shot at. Just even trying More. to bring things in, right? Oh yeah. And especially trying to extract, uh, say people get into trouble, and they, and they do, you know, they get into stuff they're not equipped to handle. And uh, uh, people get shot down. And, you, you know, the old, I, I wasn't in Vietnam very long. And I, was, uh, I didn't have to fly that particular day. I was in the old club drinking a, drinking a, drinking a beer. And the uh, instructor pilot for uh, our outfit just happened to be walking by, and he and uh, he saw me in there, and he came in and sat down beside me, which was strange because nobody wanted to talk to me because I was one of the new guys. <laughs> so uh, 
He came in and sat down next to me. He said, Bill, let me buy you a beer. I'm like, why, sure. So I was sitting there, you know, drinking a beer and talking to this guy. And he said, well, Bill, I, I got to run. I got a, 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 a check ride I got to give. I said, well, okay, well, we'll see you. He said, he got him and said, oh, yeah, nobody gets left behind. Nobody. And he was serious as a heart attack. And uh, <clears throat> so you had to pull uh, people out of, out of the stuff, you know, because we didn't leave, uh, we did not want to leave anybody behind, and that's how I, I got that award that I did. Yeah, tell me about this mission. Well, <clears throat> this is the Distinguished Flying Cross. Right. So, um, well, heroism while participating in aerial flight. Yeah. Well, the uh, a couple of guys in our, uh, our outfit had been had been shot down uh, uh, t close to the uh, that uh, Ashall Valley that resupply route, and uh, we'd flown all day. I was still a co-pilot then. I wasn't. I wasn't the uh, aircraft commander, but we'd flown a lot that day. And when we we got the call, why? Uh, we headed that direction. And uh, I, well, we dropped off to get uh, to get fueled up first. Then we headed off that direction. And uh, we got there, and the flare ships were dropping. Uh, flares, you know, trying to light the area up a little bit. Uh, the crew chief of the aircraft that was down, uh, he was hurt pretty bad, and he was he was crying on the radio, and that's what men sometimes do when their <clears throat> when their future is, uh, future is very uncertain. They they tend to give up, and, but anyway. Uh, we uh, we went in there to get him out. Of course, there was no way to land there. It's no, it's impossible to land. You had to hover down, uh, and you can imagine going forward to get in under some branches, then sliding to your right a little bit to get in, uh, get your rotor under uh, another uh, area of branches, then sliding back this way a little bit, then backing up, move your tail, boom to the left. It was that kind of, it was a hover hole. We couldn't, we couldn't, uh, even at that, we could not get land. There's no way. So we had on board what was called McGuire rigs. And uh, uh, make it easy, it's kind of like a rope you dangle out. Mm -hmm. And uh, guys will uh, get a hold of that, uh, that McGuire rig and you'd kind of, pull them out and uh, of course you had to make the same adjustments coming out as you did coming in and then you had that guy those those guys dangling on your uh, from the wire rigs and you couldn't drag them or brush them off you know hitting the limb or something like that or uh, so you had to be really careful for the aircraft for the crew and for the guy on the on the strings, and uh, all the time, you know, people are shooting at you. Uh, it wasn't a, st a steady. Uh, it wouldn't. I don't want to embellish it. Uh, it it wasn't uh, going on all the time. We were taking fire though, and uh, again, I was there trying to read uh, the power. Uh, uh, settings in the aircraft. Uh, I was trying to do some uh, uh, radio communications, and uh, we, we we finally came out of there and, and took those guys back to drop them off in the hospital. I don't, I don't know if any of them are dead or not. I've seen that. I've seen that happen. With they'd come in, you can see them on the McGuire rigs, and they, they'd been shot. You know, they were just. Like you expect a, a dead limp, like you expect a, a dead guy to be, but uh, and that, that's how uh, I uh, 
I got a, a, a awarded that uh, Distinguished Flying Cross, and the the, pi the command aircraft commander was a guy named uh, everybody called him Grizzly. <laughs> I can't remember his name now, but he he was uh, he was a good pilot. Yeah, must have been. I can't imagine that either. Um, so Grizzly, did you have a? It seems like nicknames were the thing in Vietnam. Well, they kind of were. Uh, my call, uh, uh, my call sign when I became aircraft commander was. Uh, they said, "What, what call sign do you want, Bill?" And they read out the numbers that were available. I said, "Well, ah, it doesn't matter to me." They say, "Well, try try one nine. You don't say nine in Vietnam uh, on the radio. You say niner." And I said. Uh, a uh, one niner, and they said, eh, "You're fit for that." My voice fit that, so kind of a southern voice, you know. <laughs> so there you go. I guess that's how I, <laughs> I came about my moniker, anyway. Huh. Okay. So, <clears throat> were there quiet moments ever in Vietnam? Did you? And was that good or scary? You know, there wasn't many uh, qu quiet uh, moments with me. Because it was, uh, uh, it, it, you know, it, it, it was rowdy uh, during the day, you know, and it was certainly rowdy in the evening because everybody getting on a toot because there's nothing else to do. There was nothing. So the pilots would all get together in the old club and uh, everybody get on a toot. And uh, we had a guy there. Uh, I like to play guitar, and we ha had a first lieutenant there. And that guy could make up songs like that. I had never been around anybody like that. But these things rhymed, and they all made sense. So we'd get going on the guitar, and this guy would, would make a song up about the day's missions. So anyway, that, uh, but you develop a very deep, uh, camaraderie with the guys that you fly with, you know. And uh, I knew that if uh, something happened to me, uh, I was not going to be left behind, mm -hmm. unlike, unlike some recent events. Um, so what happened when you returned home? And where was home? At that home at that time was in Wichita Falls. And my folks had lived there for some time, and uh, they'd walk up and down. The, they were both retired. They'd walk up and down to eat the street in the evenings, you know, talking to everybody and visiting and whatnot. But, so they were well known around the community. And I got, uh, got home, and uh, uh, they pick, come pick me up at the at the airport and took me to the house, and they had a big banner, Welcome Home Bill, and they had a couple of flags and, and, uh, and all that. I was home for 30 days, and not one person, not one, came over and said, Welcome Home Bill, not even one. And. Uh, uh, that kind of hurt. And uh, a lot of guys got treated much worse than I did. I, di I didn't go through uh, uh, San Francisco or Oakland. I didn't come back. I, I went to uh, Fort McCord, landed in Fort McCord, in, uh, Washington. I was in uniform. Uh, some of the, some of the uh, people they did not uh, want to be wearing uniform, mm -hmm. so they changed in this uh, the civilian clothes. I didn't have any civilian clothes. But, uh, I was in uniform. And, uh, it was uh, uneventful, you know. I, and uh, I got I had orders to go to uh, Germany. And uh, I spent my 
30 days off with my, my family and then uh, left to Germany. It must have been strange to be home and it be quiet and calm after all that. It was way strange. And I'd be like walking down the, the, the street there and uh, on the sidewalk in Wichita Falls and some construction bam or something like that, you know, and I'd be ducking and dodging, you know, like uh, I just reacting to what to what, uh, you know, kind of the environment I'd come from, you know. You want for a hole or get behind something. But <laughs> I, I found out one thing. When you're, when you're flying an airplane and folks are shooting at you, there's no rock to get behind. And there, there's no tree to get behind. You're just there. You're naked. And you know it. And uh, so, you know, when I when I came home and I'd hear a loud racket or some kind, well, I'd be, you know, ducking and dodging, wanting to get away. <laughs> you've, um, you, that's a, a fun um, way to look at it. But you've also struggled with that, right? So, oh yeah. Steve, tell me, d describe that. Feeling. I don't want to take uh, too far with that. But. Well, I won't go too far with it, but uh, uh, every everyone who suffers from PTSD has has triggers, you know, things that set that off. And uh, for for me, if I get in in a, a room, uh, what? It's like a family situation when there's a lot going on. There's kids going back and forth. And there's a hollering and everything. It's almost a little overload for me. I I'd like to retire to a you know a bedroom. And I'll pick guitar or something like that, or read, or get the iPad out. Uh, so I, uh, I I know I struggle with that. I uh, uh, this is my fourth marriage. <laughs> And, uh, you know, you try to uh, take all that stuff and, and you stuff it into the ugly room. You have to compartmentalize this stuff, you know. You stuff it in the ugly room. Otherwise, you go crazy thinking about it. And, uh, but it, it, try as hard as you can. It's not going to stay in the ugly room. A little steam escapes. Psst. Well, there's a broken relationship or a little more. Psst. Divorce, Psst, this you know, and uh, it's 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 just like that, and you know you you try to not not let that stuff happen, but it does it does happen, and uh, the my next door neighbor in uh, Albuquerque before I moved here to. Which, Amarillo. He said, uh, he said, Bill, uh, he said, I think you've got PTSD and I think you need to go see the VA. And he was uh, a chief master sergeant uh, out of the Air Force. He had, he had been uh, assigned in some uh, difficult areas. And uh, I thought, well, maybe he's right. So I went to the, to the VA. Uh, they gave me, I, I shunned the, the VA because I, it has such a terrible reputation. And uh, I went to the VA and uh, they gave me a, uh, uh, a lot of questions, uh, a, que a questionnaire. There's like 400 questions on it. And, uh, and after that, they gave uh, they gave me an interview, which was much more like a uh, FBI background investigation. They didn't never ha they never asked me, "Well, how do you feel? How do you feel about this? What do you think about being none of, none of that?" And uh, uh, I didn't pass. They said, "Well, you don't have any P you don't have any PTSD," and I'm thinking. 
I, I had been going to the to the uh, vet care center, and uh, all the guys around around me in my group, they all had PTSD, and I thought exactly like they do, and I reacted to situations just the same way they did. So I asked the the uh, the VA employee that was uh, in that group. I said, uh, "What do you think?" And he went and got his, his records out, and he showed me he has acute PTSD. And I don't know why the VA would tell me one thing, and in the in another place that's just exactly the opposite. And I didn't understand that. So uh, this guy told me, he said, uh, the, our group leader, he said, uh, Bill, go uh, get a uh, reevaluation. So I did. I went uh, to a, a private uh, doctor, and she had done uh, she done lots of bef uh, before. Uh, she she was uh, contracted by the VA to do investigations, or uh, uh, yeah, PTAD. Uh, PTSD investigation to see if this person had PTSD or not. She also did it for police departments. Yeah, I got I got in the, the in the room with her. She let me well, let me let me ask you a few questions. And she started asking the uh, me questions and says, "Well, she says, well, do you feel like this?" Well, she she knew exactly how I felt. You know, this lady had done that for for years. You know, and I I just ended up bawling because. Uh, uh, she was telling me, and men sometimes have difficulty expressing their their emotions uh, out of conversively. You know, we like to bang stuff against the wall or something like that. But men are really uh, not very uh, good at con uh, talking about uh, things that really uh, bother them. They're not good at expressing their emotions, whatever. And they don't listen to their bodies. You know. Uh, a woman from the time, since she's a young, a young woman, she knows how to listen to her body because of her monthly cycle she listens to all the time. Men that don't have that and they just draw blanks. Well, suck it up, you know, as what you're told. It's not macho. <laughs> yeah, that's right, not macho. So, of course, that's what, uh, that's what I did. It, it didn't uh, serve me well. So I got some... Uh, uh, treatments from the uh, from the from the VA, uh, you know, there's certain uh, medications that can really help you, uh, and there's uh, uh, certain ways to uh, deal with your uh, hot buttons, you know, uh, passively, and, uh, but it's it doesn't really go away. I know within, when they plant old Bill, why PTSD is going to be right there alongside me. That's just the way it is, and that's just life. And uh, uh, you, you you try to do the best you can given the cards you're dealt. You know what I'm saying? Right. Right. And uh, I thought some of them were dealt uh, quite unfairly, but that's just the way it goes. Mm -hmm. I can imagine why. Yeah, and uh, you know, uh, 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 particularly the way uh, uh, the rest were treated when they got home, that, that wasn't right, and uh, it just wasn't. And uh, they, the vets I know, in fact, all all the ones I I know. They, they carry that around with them, and uh, uh, when they when they when they die, that's going to be right there with them too. It's not going to go away. And what for? Why why should that vet be be hair lit for the rest of his life for crying out loud over people that, uh, especially uh, some of them. Uh, uh, in uh, high uh, 
I, uh, political uh, office, uh, burnt draft cards, uh, and we're we're, we're uh, elected to office or and reelected, and uh, you know the guy that uh, stepped out and, and uh, had to go uh, feed the bulldog. Uh, he got a, a, a third class uh, homecoming. This project related to the documentary, you know, we're recording interviews with people like you. Sure. How important is it that people understand what you went through, what you, other veterans, other people in this war went through? Well, it's, uh, it, it, it's part of our history. The, and I think it's still being, uh, it's still kind of being uh, addressed, I think. Uh, because it's not over. And uh, uh, will, will it ever be over? Well, pro well, probably not. But people need to understand, you know, it wasn't the fault of the, of the soldier. It just wasn't. Joe Tentpeg, the rag man, was not at fault for starting this war. He just was not. It was... This war was entered, to, entered into at the highest level of our government. It just was. And uh, so I could, <clears throat> when I was flying, especially flying guns, uh, I did not like anybody shooting at our guys. I just really did not like that. You know what I mean? Yes. And. Uh, when I, when I rolled in on a gun run, I was wanting to uh, to uh, put an end to that. You know, I didn't want our fellows being uh, being shot at, and uh, uh, probably had too much power as a young guy. You know, maybe I wasn't uh, really <coughs> uh, ready for something quite uh, quite like that. Yeah, and you said the adrenaline. Also affected you. Trending and going, everything's on, yeah. uh, you know, uh, high throttle, and uh, uh, that prob that probably didn't serve me very well. Yeah. Because uh, my, you know, my uh, my uh, my idea of dealing with the problem was to blow it away. Because that's what I've done in Vietnam, you know. If we have we had an issue out here, then let's get the the problem resolved. Mm -hmm. And um, of course, that's not uh, uh, acceptable. You know, I knew that. I came back. Uh, uh, I was I was always a really a self disciplined guy. So I you know I I had a career, uh, uh, and I I I did reasonably well with a career. I could have done better. But uh, given the uh, my load, well, I, I think I did pretty good. Mm -hmm. I think you did too. I appreciate your telling me your story. Why, well, sure. <laughs>